One of the problems with this process of converting questionnaires into numbers is it involves you, the researcher, or someone helping you, doing things. Whenever humans get involved, mistakes happen, things go wrong. The first thing that comes is if there are missing values. If there are things on the questionnaire that aren't there, why are they not there? And the kinds of reasons it happens, I've given you four possibilities here, are, first of all, because it's not applicable to that person. Maybe, for example, you've got a filter question <coughs> in your questionnaire. A filter question means a question that filters out people and tells them to jump over the next few questions because they don't apply to them. So it might be, for example, uh, questions about families, and you say, do you have any children? If you don't have any children, jump over the next few questions and then carry on after question 23 or whatever. And, that's, uh, and if you do, answer the next question about your children. So the next question might be, how many children do you have? And then what ages are they? And all that kind of stuff. Um, of course, that won't apply if you don't have children. So that might be the reason why there's a missing value. It might be the question simply doesn't apply to that person, either because the, the filter has taken them round, or for some other reason you hadn't thought of. By the way, if it's something you hadn't thought of, that's usually because you've not designed the questionnaire properly. You should have piloted it properly and, and found that out. But it does happen. It's not applicable. A second reason why the things are missing is because they refuse to answer. Um, it, you know, they just don't want to tell you. And of course, all respondents have the right not to answer your questions. That's part of the ethics of doing, this, doing research of this kind, is that you give people the right to hold things back and not tell you. And there are obvious reasons why they might do that. It might be because they're embarrassed by it, you know, um, or because they, um, uh, you know, really don't want people to know or something of that kind um, uh, what the answers are. Or maybe they're just fed up with you now and want to get over it quickly and go away and, and leave and so they, don't, they, they refuse to answer. Another possibility is they don't have a view. This often happens in things like Likert scale questions where we have a range of answers and they're not very sure what their answer is. They don't have a view or they haven't come across it before. Uh, perhaps you're asking, I mean, I often see this in, in uh, product surveys online where you're asking about a product and the person actually hasn't ever used the product, so they have no view about it. They can't say whether it's good or bad or whatever. I've never done that, I've never used that or whatever. So they don't have a view, so they have to leave it as missing. Now, actually, if you're properly designing the questionnaires, one thing to think about there is to have an extra box that says not applicable or no view or something like that, so they can actually tick that. So don't feel that they've, they've left out. And actually, that's good practice if you can do that as well, because that way you make sure that the person actually has read the question, they have thought about it, it's just that they don't have a view, so they tick that box. Um, <clears throat> but if you've forgotten to do that, then you will find you'll get people just simply not answering at all because they don't have a view. And the third possibility is it's just missing. And this happens because people don't read things properly, they skip over things, or because you, uh, as the, the researcher, you know, you're actually filling it in for them and you forget to fill in things or you skip over questions and so on. Just someone's made a mistake and missed things out. Now, I've already mentioned the idea of a special code for this, the 99 or 999. That's one way of dealing with a, a missing value. If you know it's missing, and you might even <coughs> categorise these four reasons. If you know it's not applicable, you might have a code for that. You might have a code for didn't have a view. Um, you might even have a code for refused to answer. Um, that certainly has been done. It's hard to have a code for just missing because you never know <laughs> that that's the reason. Um, so you can't have a code for that. So you can have codes if you want to for these different kinds of reasons why it's missing. But I have to say most often it's just blank and we, we give it 99 for, for missing. Or possibly just enter no number at all. When you're entering numbers into SPSS or into another spreadsheet like Excel, you can just leave the cell empty, not put anything in there at all. That's probably not good practice because you don't know why it's empty. Um, it's good if you know it's empty because there's a missing value on the original questionnaire, so I put in 99 to indicate that. If it's just blank, you don't know, is it when I just missed off by mistake at some stage? Is it, should I go back to the questionnaire and check and so on? So it's not good practice to have gaps in, in, in the spreadsheet. You should really put numbers in there because it helps you check. Um, but sometimes, you know, 
we all get lazy and we all get you know simple um, routes to things and just <coughs> leaving it empty often is is an option that, that it makes life more bearable I suppose it, it doesn't take up so much time so the good practice is use number but I must have to say even I have just left blanks into things to, to, to indicate missing values okay so that's missing numbers um, <coughs> there are ways of checking for that as well and I mentioned that in just a moment because the the last big issue I want to deal with is is the data quality as I say, this process of going from questionnaires into the data matrix numbers, human process, the process of analysis, of course you want the numbers to accurately reflect what was on the questionnaire, and you hope that accurately reflects what the person thought. So you're trying to capture what the person's views were in your numbers. If you make mistakes, you're going to get inaccurate data, you're going to get the wrong results. So it's important to try and make sure that that transfer from one to the other is done accurately. And that whole process is called data cleansing, of going through and making sure it's been entered correctly, that the interpretations you make of the data make sense, and so on and so forth. It can be quite a big job. I mean, I was involved in a project the last couple of years called the Coping Project, which was a um, European, big European funding project. We had four countries collaborating, uh, UK, uh, Sweden, Germany and, and Romania all collaborating and collecting data. We did a large scale survey of families. We were interested in how young children coped when one of their parents was in prison, either mother or father in prison. So we sent out questionnaires to large numbers of people. We knew someone in the family was in prison and we, we also sent out questionnaires to the children as well. I think we started at aged um, eight, I think something like that, eight and upwards, eight to, to 16 with the children. Um, and unfortunately, the researchers involved, it wasn't me, fortunately, I didn't have to do this job, but somebody else working on the project had spent loads and loads of time going through <coughs> cleaning up the data, going back to the original questionnaires, checking them against the numbers that we'd entered and so on, making sure the interpretations were done correctly, there hadn't been mistakes done and, and so on and so forth. And it took an awful lot of time to check that. But it is an important aspect uh, of, of, of doing quality research to make sure that the numbers you actually work on with your stats are a real accurate reflection of what the person thought when they filled in the questionnaire. Now, what I've given you here is some three ways that you might do that checking. Of course, you can go back by hand, check against the questionnaire if you've got a paper version. That's why you number the, the, the paper questionnaires. Or go back to the online version if you've got it in, in, uh, for an online survey. Um, and check it. Um, but you can also do some other kinds of things to check whether you've got any errors in, in your data. So one thing is to do frequencies. I haven't actually explained what these are yet, but I will talk about these in later weeks. Frequencies is just going through and displaying how many of each category. How many ones, how many twos, how many threes, how many fours, and so on. And if you do that and you find you've got some value sevens that you didn't code, then you know that's a mistake. Somehow the number seven crept in. You didn't have seven categories, you only had six, and the number seven suddenly appears, you know you've made a mistake. Or if you get, you've coded one, two, and three, and suddenly you get a number 57 appearing, you know you've made a mistake. You've clicked the wrong buttons at some stage and entered the wrong number. So frequencies can quickly tell you if you've got any false numbers in there, categories you shouldn't actually have at all. You can do a cross-tabulation, which is the same as a frequency, but you cross-tabulate into a table, so you have columns and rows, and the columns might be uh, the, the variables you've got, and the rows might be um, perhaps some categories of some of your respondents. So you might say, I want to compare people with no children and people with children against categories of answers to do with their families. And if you then find you've got some numbers in the box for people who have no children, but who are giving you how many children they have, you know you've got a mistake there. They shouldn't be answering that question because they said they had no children. So something's wrong there. Now, of course, the trouble is, very often you don't know what's wrong. Now, one of the problems with, with checking data quality here is that sometimes you realise you're not sure. Is it that that person ticked the wrong box on, <coughs> I have no children, and then realised that was wrong and put in the number of children they've got and so on and answered other questions? Or is it that they actually really don't have children and somehow the wrong numbers have got in and, and either you typed in some numbers or something else happened? Again, a good reason for going back to the questionnaire. Because if that happened to me with one of my questionnaires, I'd look back at the questionnaire and I'd think, well, actually, has this person answered 
the, the several questions I had about the family. If they have done that, I think actually they made a mistake on the previous question when they were asked about whether they had children or not. So actually they genuinely do have children, they genuinely answer those questions, those numbers should be in there. On the other hand, if I check back to the questionnaires and find that I've got the box ticked that says no children, and actually no, no answers to the questions following, but I've got a number on my, my spreadsheet, my, my data matrix, I think, ah, I've made a mistake. I've entered a number there by mistake that shouldn't be in there. I've clicked the keys uh, by mistake, and so I can take that out. So going back to the originals is often one way of resolving those kinds of data entry problems. And crosstabs is one way to find that out. Last possibility is some logical checks. You can do that just looking through the data and, and see whether it makes sense. Uh, so check the logic. Is it possible for this kind of person to have been doing this kind of thing? And uh, it brings to mind an example I had many years ago now. A colleague was doing some, uh, some work on childhood accidents, you know, accidents that children have. And one of the things he did is got hold of some data from the local hospital of the A&D admissions. So he actually, he actually negotiated with the hospital and, uh, and said to them, can I have the data for the last year uh, for the children you have admitted into accident and emergency, into A&E? And he got it. He got a, a load of data, which he then asked me to, 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 to start analysing and, and to, to sort through. As I started looking through this data, remember this was data for children only, so this was aged, I think it started at something like one or two, up to... Uh, 15, I think the age like, range was, 15 or 16, something like that. So those were the ages of the children. The ages appeared in, in, in the data. So for each person, there was a number saying their age and so on. Um, and then another column was their place uh, where they lived, their residence. And of course, a lot of them was just addresses they lived in. Uh, this is all confidential data, by the way. <laughs> it wasn't spread around the addresses, but it was useful to have that so we could tell where they lived. But I was then surprised when I saw one or two children aged, I don't know, nine years old, who appeared to live in an old people's home. And I thought, what's going on here? You, you don't have children in old people's homes, do you? That can't be right. I thought, well, what's, what's happened here? And then I suddenly realised what probably had happened. I don't know for sure, but my guess was, because there must have been about 10 or 12 of them throughout the whole data set, thousands of, of ch children on the, on the data set, but I found about 12 of them. I think what happened was that whoever was entering the data, you know, somebody in the hospital, um, you know, a nurse or an assistant or something, had been typing away on the computer entering the data. How old is this child? Oh, this child is nine, that put in a nine. But of course, the data comes from all the A&D figures, and the A&E figures include everybody, all the adults too. So what I think happened was an old person came in from an old per people's home. They'd been taken to A&E, some emergency, they had a heart attack or something, or they'd fallen over and broken their hip or whatever. In they came to A&E, their data were entered, but when they said, my age is 89, the person entering the data only put in nine. And that was the number that appeared. So a mistake was made. So what I was finding was people who shouldn't have been in, who actually weren't children at all, they were living in old people's homes and they shouldn't have been in this data at all. They were in there by accident because someone had wrongly entered their age. So that's how a logical check might pick that up. You might look at the data and say, this doesn't make any sense at all. <coughs> Something's wrong here. They shouldn't be here. We have to leave out this data because it's, it's clearly wrong. So that's data cleansing, checking your data, make sure, make sure you've entered it correctly, making sure it makes sense. Um, and make sure in the end that the numbers you're actually working on do truly reflect the, the people and society you're actually studying and what they think. <laughs> <laughs>